Welcome. The Leadership Lesson Podcast inspires leadership growth in everyone. We have enthralling conversations with top leaders in order to provide you with life-changing lessons. My name is Caleb Nichols. I'm a speaker, a pastor, and a family man. My hope is to inspire spiritual depth and leadership growth in you. I love to sit down with leaders from a variety of fields, hear their personal stories and leadership experiences. This creates the podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to the Leadership Lessons Podcast. Our guest today is Kristen Dumay. Kristen is a best-selling author and professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University. She holds a PhD from the University of Notre Dame and her research focuses on the intersection of gender, religion and politics, three enormous areas, which is uh, very exciting. Today, we're going to focus a little bit on her book, which is titled Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a nation. So thank you, Kristen, for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. And you're coming all the way from uh, Michigan, I believe. Yes, it's Grand Rapids, time. Michigan. Great. It's nighttime there and uh, it's early morning here. So I've just been sipping a coffee trying to, trying to wake up and uh, you're probably ready to get going to bed. Soon, soon. <laughs> so tell us about the book, Kristen. What is the uh, thesis of the book? What, what, what's the message you're trying to relay through the book, Jesus and John Wayne? Essentially, it's a history of the last half century or so of white evangelicalism uh, and particularly looking at the strand of um, how masculinity, evangelical ideals of masculinity are intertwined with militarism. Uh, and it traces this through uh, kind of political history, but also cultural history, really looking at the popular culture of evangelicals and how this has shaped a particular, uh, particularly militant conception of uh, evangelicalism in the United States. Mm, fascinating. And, and the introduction of the book talks a little bit about yourself and where you grew up and also about Donald Trump and the beginning of his campaign uh, in 2016. So does the, the book takes quite a deep look at why Donald Trump uh, came into power. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I actually started this research on evangelical masculinity and militarism more than 15 years ago. And I was a new professor at Calvin University here, and it was actually my students who introduced me to this literature on Christian manhood that was very rugged, very militant, and it reminded them a lot of what I had just taught them about in class on Teddy Roosevelt and how masculinity was linked, not just to religion, but to whiteness and to empire and to power. And, and so they, they brought this to my attention. So I started the research a long time ago, set it aside for a time. And it was in the fall of 2016 when I picked it up again, um, particularly when I noticed uh, the language that so many evangelicals were using to defend their support for Donald Trump in, uh, at that point, even uh, after, he was revealed on camera uh, to be boasting about uh, assaulting women. Uh, it reminded me so much of what I had read all those years earlier in these books on Christian manhood. Um, men are filled with testosterone um, and God made them that way so that they can be aggressive and uh, fight to protect faith, family, and nation. And, and that's when it kind of clicked for me. So it was at that point that I, I decided to pull up that old research uh, and and try to fill in the missing pieces and bring it up to not just 2016, but into the Trump presidency. Okay. And and for us here in Australia, there might be a, it, the, the language uh, might, might not be as familiar to us. So maybe we can define a couple of terms. So when you say evangelicalism, like, what are you meaning there exactly? Yeah, it's, it's not always clear to a lot of Americans either because there are contested definitions. Uh, so there are different ways that scholars or journalists or evangelicals themselves will define evangelicalism. And most scholars uh, traditionally have used a definition coined by David Bebbington, a historian of British evangelicalism. And it's known as the Bebbington quadrilateral because there's four points to it. And mm -hmm. so according to that definition, and this is the definition the National Association of Evangelicals will, will put up on their website, uh, so evangelicals um, are known for their biblicism, their uh, belief in the authority of the scriptures, crucicentrism, the centrality of the cross of Christ, conversionism, the born again experience, and then activism. So they're acting out of these faith commitments. And initially, that's what I planned on using. 
uh, when I was writing a book about evangelicals. That's what everybody seems to do. But as I as I was doing my research, I realized that that set of characteristics, um, largely theological, didn't really describe the movement that I was seeing. Mm -hmm. And so I end up in this book uh, treating evangelicalism as a cultural and political movement okay. and in many ways as a consumer culture. And so mm -hmm. Jesus and John Wayne is a history of popular evangelicalism. Christian publishing industry is massive. I know some of our books end up over on your bookshelves in Australia. A Christian radio, Christian music, Christian television, this popular evangelicalism that really shapes the experience far more than a set of kind of theological, um, uh, you know, doctrinal beliefs. And that's important too, because we, we have to talk about whiteness when we talk about evangelicalism in the United States. When you take those four points and you look uh, at black Protestantism, the majority of black Protestants can check off all of those boxes, but the majority of black Protestants who can check off all those boxes do not identify as evangelical at all because it is very clear to them that there is much more to be an evan being an evangelical than just those theological beliefs and mm -hmm. and that's a, a sign that right this is a cultural identity um and a cultural community as much as if not more than a, a kind of religious uh uh tradition great i, I think that's really helpful because i think for you know you're you're especially over here in australia where the racial issue is just not as deeply rooted in our culture and, and even largely misunderstood. And it's difficult for us because all of our um, movies and our TV and the popular culture that comes out of America, we're very familiar with it. Um, we're familiar with the terms, but it's not really in our uh, history as much. I mean, there's a, obviously elements of racism in any country like ours, where there's been colonialism and things like that, there hasn't been a perfect track record. Uh, but we haven't had a civil war. We haven't had a civil rights movement. We haven't had any of those things. So I think that definition um, really helps to separate um, the movement, as you say, um, from the theological uh, piece. So, And so I suppose in saying that, um, I, 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 the point I'm hearing is that the meshing of those two together uh, cr creates this, has created this cultural uh, epoch, if you like, where Donald Trump came to power. Yeah, you know, when uh, when the signs were becoming clear that white evangelicals were were his his most stalwart supporters throughout the primary season uh, up to the election and certainly after up to the present day, a lot of people were asking this question of how could evangelicals betray their values to vote yeah, for a man like yeah. Donald Trump, right? Family values, evangelicals, what's going on here? Mm. And that's where if you just take at face value, you know, family values or, uh, you know, their theology, you see it's an absolute disconnect. But if you understand that this is a cultural movement, and if we understand historically, which is what my book traces, that at the center of family values politics, we see the assertion of white patriarchal authority. And as soon as you see that, a lot of other things start to fall into place. And we're not looking at a betrayal of evangelical values, ultimately. In many ways, it's the fulfillment of those values. Mm. Okay, that's very deep. I, I, I think it's really fascinating. And uh, I want to, I, I said to you, I didn't read all the book. I want to keep reading the book uh, to, to really get the uh, underpinning of it. So, so for, for some people, I think would obviously ask, and maybe you've been asked this, isn't this just a feminist critique on religion or a feminist critique on politics? I've just finished some um, graduate studies myself and that, you know, in theology and that the feminist critique is very strong. It's very popular at the moment. Obviously, you've got some expertise in that area of gender and um, mm -hmm. and religion. So how do you, I, I was trying to pick out what would be an obvious question for someone. Isn't this just a feminist critique and just a feminist angle on all of this? So what do you say to that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I guess you could say that I actually haven't been asked that question. So that's an interesting one. Um, certainly, my expertise is shaped by a background in gender history and the study of gender but also in religious history, right? Those are those are my two fields that I, I brought together um, throughout my career and that I bring together in this book. And so feminism is connected to gender studies, to the study of gender, although it need not always be. But one thing that, so I'm coming primarily as a historian, not as a kind of feminist activist here. Yeah. Um, I'll be a historian shaped by uh, kind of feminist um, methodologies. 
but what that, I think the most essential thing to understanding Jesus and John Wayne isn't uh, arguably a feminist agenda, uh, although maybe we could talk about that, but, but really it's just the historical understanding that gender changes over time. Right. And that ideas of masculinity and femininity change over time, which um, I think, especially for white evangelicals, is um, is hard to grasp because they talk a lot about gender, but mm-hmm. never in a way of, you know, historically situating. It's always in terms of what does the Bible say? Right. This biblicism and, and really in a sense of this is God ordained gender roles and men have always been this way and are always supposed to be this way. And what they don't realize is when they when they then add the description of this is what it is to be a man, really um, they're they're embracing a whole lot of relatively recent cultural understandings of you know white middle class post war understandings mm-hmm. of what it is to be a man or what it is to be a woman. And yep. as a historian, whether you're a feminist or not, um, if you just look to history very, very quickly, you're going to see, oh, wait, wait, that's not actually the case, right? Gender changes over time, and it's linked to things like economic shifts, it's linked to race, it's linked to socioeconomic class, and it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so what I do then is I look at what ideas of masculinity pop up in which spaces, at what times, and for what reasons, and what Mm -hmm. are they doing then? And so that's really what this book is doing, looking at white evangelical ideals of masculinity, really from the 1940s to the present, and just saying, you know, how are they changing? Um, And then you can also ask, you know, as a religious historian, so what what does theology, how does theology play into this? But also, are there some places where these gender ideals, in fact, even though they're packaged and sold as Christian, do they in fact actually run counter to some core biblical teachings? And I think that's really the project of the book. Fascinating. Could, could you give us a quick understanding of the historical, uh, I suppose, change in masculinity from uh, the war, post-war? John Wayne. I, I grew up, and my dad showed me John Wayne cowboy movies when I was when I was a kid. And then, um, you know, it was definitely in the '90s as a young man. It was um, Braveheart, and you talk about Driscoll and Mars Hill and Braveheart, one of my favorite yeah. movies. So, so I'm really fascinated by what, how would you see that historical um, I suppose, roadmap over the last 50 to 70 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to go even a little further back. Like I do in the book, just a quick glance into the 19th century, because that really sets up change over time because in the 19th century, uh, it was popular to have a, a, a more, uh, kind of gentlemanly conception of Christian masculinity, right. Among American Christians, among American evangelicals to be a a Christian man was to exhibit gentlemanly self-restraint. Right. And it's, it's kind of important to put that in the, in the back backdrop. Then in the 20th century, you have this kind of Teddy Roosevelt, rugged masculinity, you have muscular Christianity take hold in the 1910s. uh, And, but that even then there's still change over time. It's not like it's, it's there. We have it Uh, because you had liberal Protestants who embraced muscular Christianity every bit as much as conservative Protestants did. And also another, another strand that Jesus and John Wayne really follows is the Christian masculinity, this evangelical masculinity at the center of the book is closely tied to Christian nationalism, mm-hmm. right? The, the idea that America is God's special country and it has to be defended as such. That also wasn't really, uh, it, it, it didn't look the same back in the, in the early 20th century where you would have liberal Protestants who are as likely to be Christian nationalists as um, conservative Protestants and not all conservative Protestants were Christian nationalists, right? So setting up a lot of, um, it didn't used to look like it does now. So that we can see in the 1940s and particularly in the early Cold War, this um, uh, particular mode of gender difference strong masculinity, assertive masculinity to protect against communism, right? Family values, evangelicalism really comes to the fore. Mm -hmm. And and that we see continue on through uh, the next several decades, even as many other Americans who in the 1940s and 50s would have shared all of those values. Um, In the 1960s, that's when we see this real, uh, real rupture. And many Americans start to question, you know, traditional gender roles, which were actually relatively recent origin. Also, we have the civil rights movement disrupting the racial status quo, and you have the Vietnam War. 
Mm. And a lot of Americans start to question American goodness and American greatness, right? Mm. And all of these things, it's uh, the assertion of white patriarchal authority that reestablishes order, reasserts the status quo. And that's what conservative evangelicals really double down on when many other Americans are, are questioning those values. And mm. so that's really the story here. And then how this, um, this emphasis on gender difference on female submission, femininity, domesticity, all very um, mid-century uh, white middle class, right? Mm -hmm. And then this masculinity that involves both the provider and the protector. So breadwinner, masculinity, but also protector. And in the Cold War Vietnam era, that's that's a, a, a warrior masculinity, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. aggression. Um, and, and how that ends up moving to the center of evangelical identity. And ultimately I argue in the book, really displacing some core Christian teaching so that there are explicit examples where evangelicals will say, uh, you know, you, you can't teach a boy to become a man, uh, by teaching him to turn the other cheek, you know, love your enemies, love your neighbors. No, 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 no. Right. You know, no, we need to be strong. We need to be aggressive. We need to teach boys to fight. Um, mm. and so that's the kind of story I tell, but yes, Braveheart is, uh, one of my favorite parts. Braveheart, uh, came along in the 1990s after a period end of cold war promise keepers evangelical men's movement everything was kind of up in the air it seemed like maybe we're you know drifting into a more progressive direction and then uh we have brave heart uh, uh mid mid 1990s and that just becomes this kind of rallying cry for so many evangelical men and it still is around today in that culture a call to a tougher masculinity uh, God is a warrior God and men are made in his image. Every man has a battle to fight. And that just spawns like uh, hundreds of copycat books and so many sermons, sermon clips playing the movie. You know, it just really comes to define what it is to be a Christian man, at least in some sort of ideal form. Mm. So are you saying that that's wrong or are you saying that it's an overemphasis? Like where's, the, uh, where's the middle ground? Where's the truth in there? Yeah. So, so as a historian, first, I'm just saying it is right. This is what we see happen. And then, and then we can go on and say, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And that's where almost always you're going to get some sort of a, it's complicated answer if you ask a historian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we can look on, on an individual level. And so I've heard from a lot of men who, you know, really were inspired say by the evangelical men's movement. Mm. Um, I've heard from a lot of men who were really put off by the evangelical men's movement and by this kind of warrior masculinity. A lot of men who said, uh, you know, I felt like a second class man and uh, a second class Christian in these spaces because I'm not tough. I don't like to go climb, uh, uh, you know, mountains on the weekend. I wouldn't mind going to an art museum with my friends, you know, and there's like it, no That's place so in everyone. Yeah, in some of these spaces, right? For uh, when when you're using this kind of artificially constructed ideal of not just masculinity, but God ordained Christian manhood, right? Mm -hmm. And you're linking somebody's faith to this cultural construction of masculinity that makes sense only for a small number of men, particular racial identity, and especially socioeconomic class, right? All of these things. And you can see how limiting that is. Now, on the one hand, you know, some men could watch Braveheart and draw some good lessons from it and be momentarily inspired. And that's fine, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's not really what we see happening. And what we see is um, in time, this, this particular model of what it is to be a Christian man doesn't yeah. just shape ideas of masculinity, but it ends up shaping Christianity itself so that mm -hmm. Jesus Christ ends up being kind of recast as a brave heart figure, you know, in, in Driscoll's uh, words, he's, uh, you know, this, this warrior with tattoos down his leg, riding on his horse, wielding a bloody sword, charging into battle. Now you can pull a little bit of that from revelation, but if that's your only vision of Christ really that you're holding up, you're going to miss a whole lot of the gospel uh, yeah. in, in that presentation. I think, and I think you make a great point, And we do this a lot in Christianity. Um, and, and humans do this a lot anyway, because we have to simplify things in order to understand the world. But I think tying uh, something like a brave heart or that picture of um, manhood, tying that to spirituality or spiritual maturity 
or discipleship um, is, is, is where I often as a pastor see we get things wrong because we're looking for a way to explain to people how to follow Jesus. That's our you know, core business for me as a pastor. How do you follow Jesus? How do you grow in your faith? And then when it becomes tied to something that's, um, that's cultural or that's a movie in Hollywood or something like Braveheart wasn't made uh, to represent male Christianity, but it's, it's linked, we link it in. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's where you can really get the trouble. And it becomes oversimplified, doesn't it? As you said, it just becomes Driscoll's Jesus with the bloody sword on a white horse, uh, as opposed to Jesus, you know, dying on a cross in ultimate humility and shame. And what about that picture of Jesus, which is more central to faith than, than, exactly. than the white horse referenced in Revelation. So, um, yeah, I think that, I think it's a really big problem. So, so, I know you probably wouldn't want to do this, but could you try and give us some sense of, uh, you know, where you think healthy manhood lies in Christianity? If we can separate it from some of this cultural stuff, in your opinion, and you've done a lot of research, um, well, where where is healthy Christian masculinity? Yeah, uh, you're right. This isn't, you know, usually, uh, or I didn't set out to write this book to tell people how to be, you know, a good Christian man, but um, especially in evangelical spaces, as you might imagine, I get this question all the time. And so I have had a chance uh, to answer a time or two. And one of the first times I got this question actually was in a in a church before the book even came out. Um, and I was pre presenting on the topic. And uh, what I ended up doing was just writing, um, I had a whiteboard behind me and I, I just wrote the fruits of the spirit, mm. uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Mm. I, I would suggest we could start there for biblical mm. manhood. Mm. And what's, what's startling is how few of the, you know, hundreds of books on Christian manhood center those. Yeah. Right. And what we see happening in this uh, and evangelicals, again, for half a century, really, really emphasize gender difference. So men mm -hmm. and women are different, as James Dobson said, in every cell of their bodies. I mean, technically true, <laughs> but then takes that to mean and therefore are opposites. So men are strong. Women are weak. Men are aggressive. Women are vulnerable. You know, just these complete opposites. And so what, what we end up then is something like, you know, virtues, the fruit of the spirit, uh, patience, gentleness, those are feminine traits. So those mm. are not what men are supposed to be. And it ends up really distorting uh, the scriptures and in discipleship, because if you look at uh, the, the New Testament, certainly, you know, the vast majority of the New Testament is written, you know, for all of us, very mm. few verses are gender specific. And even those can be analyzed according to context in different ways. But let's just bracket those for now and take, you know, what does it mean to follow Christ? Mm. It is a radical call, right? It is in, in Jesus, as I understand um, Christianity, um, as you suggested, you know, this is a this is a model of kind of divesting of power. This is the suffering servant. This is, um, uh, you know, it just totally messed with his followers' expectations for what a Messiah was going to look like. They wanted the power. They wanted the warrior. They wanted the earthly power yes, the king. and the yep. glory. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what he did not come to bring. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we look at what does it mean to follow Christ for women and for men, but certainly for men and as a corrective, I mean, it's got to be that that um, divestment of power and um and i'm not talking a bland servant leadership model mm -hmm. which tends to you know tag on that servanthood model talk it a, a you know good talk about being a servant but it's really to bolster up no i i i have a right to lead and and i i should be leading and i'm i can feel really good about uh exercising power it can very easily get twisted yeah so, so essentially you're saying kristen that where Christianity has gone wrong recently is when it's taken the theology or the biblical understanding of following Christ and then it started to diverge into what that looks like within gender roles. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So we've got Christ and we've got Christianity, but then we've got the female Christian or we've got the male Christian and then we've got the male Christian white leader and the female wife should be doing X, Y, Z. And that was a part of, again, going back to Mars Hill and the whole Christianity Today podcast that they made a real point of 
yeah. Driscoll's um, way, uh, uh, his book on marriage, I forget what it was called. And Real wife, Marriage. And Real Marriage. And all of that was quite a big feature in that podcast. And uh, I suppose that was a very in-your-face example of uh, gender roles, really dividing them and making them, you know, incredibly. And I suppose is that, sorry, I'm throwing a few things at you here, um, but I suppose is that where women can feel very boxed just like, as you said before, men can feel very boxed if they're not the aggressive sporting type male. That oh, absolutely. Feel. Yeah, yeah. And we're really missing Yeah, that. you know, women women in an evangelical church, I just ask some women, I don't know quite what it's like in Australia, but I'd imagine that there are some connections, but, you know, you walk into an evangelical uh, mega church and you're invited to the women's ministry and, you know, get, get ready for a lot of floral motifs and pink and, uh, you know, and maybe the, the women's Bible study is scheduled for 10 a.m. on a weekday. And so, so much for you, if you have a job, you know, these kinds of things are just kind of implicit, but they're they're right in your face at the same time, if you are a woman and if you're a woman who doesn't fit into those boxes. So same effect, you know, is this, is the problem me? Am I, is there something wrong with me? And I need to change That's certainly what Driscoll would say. Absolutely. You need to change. You need to not work out of the home. You need to change your appearance. You need to change your demeanor. Or, you know, is there no place for me in this Christianity? Is, is there, I, I, am I not a Christian, right? And so you can see the, the, the problems with this. Um, it, essentially, you know, it's these, these ideals are being constructed and then, you know, I, I'm not sure if idol is quite the right word, but certainly ends up displacing, uh, the gospel teachings, which tend to be just incredibly disruptive and countercultural. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Now your, your, your wife would love my, my wife, sorry, would love what you're saying. She's, uh, she has a PhD as well, and, uh, she hates the term pastor's wife. So. <laughs> I joke, I, I joke. She's a pastor herself as well. We call her a pastor around our church. So I, I joke with her and say, "Well, I go around saying to everyone, I'm a, I'm a uh, pastor's husband." So that keeps her happy. <laughs> no, but yeah. it's very, I think like I have concerns with the church being over feminized and weak in that way. But then, as you're saying, women definitely, I can see that perspective having concerns with the church being. Um, you know, overly masculine or or maybe overly feminine as well, as you say, with the floral motifs. There's lots of women and my wife included who are, are not very keen on those things and hate that kind of, I suppose, caricature that happens so quickly. It's like a women's event. Oh, okay, that means we have to have this kind of, you know, decor, we have to have this kind of person speak. And um, yeah, she's not that way inclined at all. So I, I think that you're really helping me. I think it's going to help a lot of people on the podcast with the gender roles and how we've separated them. So from a historical perspective, um, why do you think we've got to this in our culture? What, what was it this way a hundred years ago? Uh, was life a lot simpler? So there wasn't as much, I suppose, choice. I, I, I know that uh, I think we're all aware that affluence has created a lot more choice for us in the West, whether you're male or female. Is that where a lot of this has come from? What's your perspective there? Um, I mean, if you look at any point in history, you'll find some interesting things going on with respect to gender and religion. And, you know, I, I want to um, talk just a moment about the language that you use there about, uh, you know, concerns about uh, the church being feminized and kind of weak. And then also on the flip side, you know, this overly masculinized. Um, you know, you, just a reminder that those words are, there's no kind of essential meaning and to link femininity and weakness right there, right? You're, you're kind of playing with this trope here. And I just want to make sure that we we um, um, name what's happening there, that there's maybe not anything essential, you know, essentially weak. I mean, yes, we could talk about physical strength and averages and things like that. But usually when people are talking about weakness in terms of, you know, feminization, they're talking about a whole lot more than, than um just physical strength. So even that kind of language, I would want to kind of um, pick apart a little bit and exactly, and go exactly where you went with it, which is, you know, you caught yourself and you're like, wait, but women also don't like that kind of feminized church so much. Yeah. Many women do not, you know, an oh, quote unquote feminized church and, um, or the overly masculinized and many men same on both sides. Um, so just to keep in mind that there's, you know, when we're talking about femininity, it's a kind of cultural construction. And, you know, and then we often forget because we're, we're all kind of, you know, it becomes common sense. That's what we describe it. And even as we personally are feeling a disconnect as a woman, as a man, this doesn't work for me. Um, so um, again, history is going to move us away from essentialist understandings of these terms. But if you go back to the 19th century, 
Um, historians then locate the feminization of American Christianity. And in the early 20th century, this muscular Christianity movement was a backlash against the perceived feminization of the church. And um, so that's history. But what we can also see is um, the sense of crisis was usually linked to an underlying economic shift. Mm -hmm. So that in the Victorian era, for example, this idea of gentlemanly restraint uh, and Victorian femininity made sense for a time among white middle-class Americans. And particularly this idea of masculinity made sense in a kind of entrepreneurial economy where you could invest, you could start your own business and self-restraint was very good because then you saved money and then you could invest it in your business. And that made a, a whole much of sense. By the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, you see a dramatic economic shift mm -hmm. from this, you know, agrarian and then um, entrepreneurial capitalist economy into a more modern consumer economy where more and more men are not owning their businesses. They're they're punching the clock or they're middle managers. They're never going to own their own business. Why save? Why invest? And this is our kind of consumer capitalism that takes hold. It's at moments like that, that ideas of masculinity and femininity seem to be in crisis because yeah. they don't make sense the same way. They don't fit the same way and it seems disruptive. And so just the historical perspective um, teaches us to first be a little bit um, uh, measured whenever anybody says there's a crisis of femininity or, or masculinity or the feminization is happening. It's like, oh yeah, we've heard this before. Sure, um, sure. What's really happening underneath here? Mm, fantastic. No, that re it's really, really helpful. I, I love history and looking back and stuff. I think there's just so much wisdom. Uh, in it, and it's amazing how there's you know ne never anything new under the sun, is there, Christian? That's the power of the uh, the the uh, historian like yourself is it can help us see you know we've had these questions before, we've tried to answer them before, and done well or not done well. So just yeah. going back to the title of your book again, so John Wayne, uh, again maybe for the Aussie it it it, it isn't as deep an understanding. Uh, we kind of have cowboys uh, here; uh, they're a little bit different. Um, we have ranches, if you like, that um, you know run cattle and things like that. But uh, what, what, what's the image of John Wayne? This this kind of tough guy, like like like, what is that caricature or what is that 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 picture? So first of all, I will say I did not set to write a uh, set out to write a book about John Wayne at all. <laughs> John Wayne came into the title know, very know. yeah very late in the game actually. Uh, it was, uh, and if, if I could have found a way to fit in, you know, Jesus and Mel Gibson's William Wallace from the movie Braveheart, I, I would have put that in the title. It just didn't really fit. Uh, but it, it kind of does the same thing, right? And, and when I first read like John Eldridge's book, Wild at Heart, uh, which was the first book I read that, that opened up this uh, topic to me. And my, again, my students had introduced that book to me. I was, I was really surprised because again, um, evangelicals, um, central to their identity is this biblicism. And they, they identify as Bible-believing Christians over and above everything else. And I read this book on Christian manhood, and there really are not a lot of Bible verses in that book. Mm. And there's and the, those that are are really not, you know, contextualized very well. Um, instead, Eldridge and other writers like him look to popular culture, look to Mel Gibson's William Wallace. Um, and although Eldridge doesn't, other writers, uh, I kept seeing John Wayne popping up. And I thought that's, you know, that's weird. John Wayne, long time ago, what is, what's happening here? But if you look at the um, John Wayne, both as person, but particularly as kind of icon, as symbol, in the 19, uh, he, he rose to start him in the 1940s already, but by the 1960s and 70s, he was really reaching a kind of iconic status as a symbol of conservative American manhood. His politics were aligning with uh, uh, the Republican Party during this partisan realignment. He and Ronald Reagan were very good friends. He was pro-law and order. He was quite racist, right? All of this uh, kind of fits his actual person. But the movies that he starred in, too, he, you know, the, the cowboy in the Wild West, uh, this American soldier in the sands of Iwo Jima, Green Berets, you know, the, the, uh, in the Alamo, in all of these films, too, it's worth noting that he is, he's the white man with the gun who brings order through violence and usually by subduing non-white populations. And it's this kind of epic American motif. 
And he comes to symbolize during the 1960s in particular, during this time of upheaval where you have hippies and disorder and the status quo is up for grabs, right? He comes to symbolize the reassertion of quote unquote traditional American manhood. And what's critical there is he will use violence as necessary to bring back order. Mm, wow, that's a fantastic um, summary of John Wayne. And so that's the similar motif then that you get with uh, William Wallace and Braveheart and these kind of male figures that, that, that popular Christianity is pulled on. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it, it matters when when you think, okay, John Wayne, you know, he's been dead for quite some time and uh, wasn't an evangelical, certainly, uh, certainly not a poster boy of family values. Why do you have somebody like, you know, Eric Metaxas saying, we all know that John, you know, in his book on Christian manhood, we all know that John Wayne is kind of the icon of American yeah. manhood, right? This is this is the standard. We all know that, right? What's going on there really is the question. And again, you can see how these cultural ideals end up getting packaged and then sold as Christian, as Christian manhood, how mm. that ends up ultimately distorting what Christianity itself means. Yeah, it's amazing. You're helping open my eyes a lot more to how we're, we're drawing from the wrong source. And so that's your problem with evangelicalism, isn't it? They claim to be biblically based, but the source of the manhood is coming from these cultural uh, icons and indicators. So, yeah. and we know that like, and it's a common scripture I use with, with men of Ephesians 5, 25, that, you know, men laying down their life, uh, for their wives, for their family, as Christ laid down his life for the church. Like that for me has always been a picture of manhood, it's, mm -hmm. it's shutting up at times, it's sacrificing at times, being able to pay the price without getting the accolades, which is kind of the opposite of this John Wayne, William Wallace picture <laughs> that we're drawing on so that it's it's fascinating yeah. i mean there's some there's some overlaps right because you could take that verse and say that's absolutely william wallace right you know that's his model but it depends you know the laying down your life uh you know it, it is one thing the you know going and dismembering thousands of uh you know your your enemies uh in, in bloody warfare and continuing this vendetta right that that's kind of something else and that that's another motif that i look at in evangelicalism is this um the interplay between this militant conception of christian manhood and a militancy really at the core of evangelicalism itself so mm -hmm. that um, to sustain this militant conception, it requires the continual uh, creation of enemies, right? Mm -hmm. This us versus them culture. And mm -hmm. early on when I was working on this book, I kind of um, assumed what a lot of pundits were saying that sure, evangelicals might be extreme or they're embracing Trump, but um, they're doing that because they are so afraid. They're afraid of their religious liberties. They're afraid of demographic decline, right? They're, they have a lot of fears. And so that explains their militancy in this moment. Historically speaking, what I came to see by looking at figures like uh, Jerry Falwell Sr., Mark Driscoll, uh, I have a whole chapter of these very strange fake ex-Muslim terrorists in Jesus and John Wayne. It's, it's this crazy story. All of those stories, um, it, it, I, I suddenly came to see that we needed to flip that script, that it wasn't evangelical militancy uh, that provoked um, uh, or that that um, was a response to this fear. Often the militancy was there first. And then mm -hmm. leaders like Falwell, like Driscoll, like many leaders in the religious right intentionally stoked, provoked fear in the hearts of their followers in order to consolidate their own power. And that's once I, once I saw that so many of these things uh, fell into place. And I think, I think it's for me as a pastor, again, it's, I find it very sad when um, Christians um, are, are doing this, when they're creating these enemies. And I yes. wonder if it gives rise to some of this um, end times talk that has kind of reared its head again recently uh, post COVID and, and this need to create the enemy and the, demons or the people that are against us and obviously in, in, in Australia and America we have um, concerns around Christians being uh, unable to freely follow their faith and in Australia at the moment it's really around Christian schooling is a big issue because our Christian schooling is government funded uh, which is very unique in Australia unlike many nations in the world so it's phenomenal 
opportunity for Christianity in, in the fact that the government funds our Christian schools and we're freely allowed to uh, share the gospel and things like that. Uh, but there's there's pressure coming on that. And uh, we actually, you probably don't realise this, Kristen, but actually tomorrow is our um, federal elections. So we're all going to the uh, polling booths tomorrow to uh, vote for our prime minister. So, um, you know, these issues are really fresh in our mind uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. So, yeah, I suppose my question for you is more around, yeah, Christianity creating these enemies um, and, and then that becoming a political thing. Like I almost see when I talk to people, um, they're trying to, they're, 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 they're interested in politics, they're interested in cultural commentary. Um, Australians have become almost oddly interested in American politics over the last few years. Like people talk to me as if they're going to vote Republican or Democrat, and I sometimes have to say to them, "Do you realise it's not our country, and no one cares what you think? Like <laughs> you have no say over there. You, you <laughs> like it's so weird. People are. I think the rise of the internet and technology. You know, people are just things are so globalised now. We get this." exportation of uh, American culture, American politics. It's just people are following it. It's a hobby. And it's like, it yeah. doesn't really matter. It's not going to affect your life. You can't vote in it. Whatever. But then in Christianity, like people are tying this like spiritualism to right or left or good or bad or who's evil or who's righteous. And, I'm, and I, for me, I just, just do not think there's a connection at all. And I don't think Jesus and Christianity or discipleship is about left and right it's about much bigger questions than that obviously so yeah what, what what do you think of all that oh absolutely and my apologies that we're exporting so much of this <laughs> really you know a toxic uh culture that where you're right politics has become entertainment mm -hmm. uh it's it's um our primary kind of way that we self-identify it mm -hmm. defines who we see as one of us and and who is not and you absolutely see that in the american church where uh you know i think some of my fiercest critics are my quote unquote brothers in christ right mm -hmm. <laughs> um you know uh conservative white evangelical men i will also say some of my biggest fans are conservative complementarian white evangelical men so it, it 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 all depends but what we you know whereas christ calls us to unity <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh and and i'm not a fan of of just claiming that unity in the face of disunity we need yeah. to acknowledge that we what we have is disunity and we shouldn't pretend otherwise and in my country particularly the the racial divisions um within our churches are really important to acknowledge and not paper over uh and and at the same time what we see is that the 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 politics is really what the unifying forces not mm -hmm. the faith Yes. And, and that isn't a biblical model. And yeah, it's Christians who are, who are really fueling that and driving that polarization. I mean, that's the second half of my subtitle, the, the fracturing a nation. Mm -hmm. What does this look like when a pretty huge swath of Americans, um, I think that what, what they value is not just what they value, but that God is on their side. Mm -hmm. And that they have this duty to, um, uh, you know, to to make America Christian again, make mm -hmm. America great again, uh, in in their particular understanding of what that means, which often doesn't involve, uh, you know, economic equality or racial justice or a whole host of other things, uh, environmental care, any of that. It, it means a very narrow set of of um, values. So, what does that end up doing then to our democratic system? it positions a pretty big chunk of conservative white Americans to see everybody else as their enemy and yeah. as God's enemy. And yeah. so you're not really in a place to say, hey, let's compromise because mm. compromise with the devil or compromise with the enemy. No, yeah. there is no place for that. And that has really, um, really eroded, mm. I think, our, our democratic uh, norms and yeah, uh, institutions. And I think there's a huge amount for us to understand in this space. And I hope that uh, you have opportunity to do more work in this area, because I think, yeah, I think you're right. The fracturing, the division, again, at the very core of Christianity is meant to be unity over, um, you know, the core tenets of the faith, yet somehow it's become politicized. And, you know, everyone lost friends during the COVID pandemic because it became a political issue and vaccinations and 
you know, in Australia, I mean, I I'm in Melbourne, so we're the most locked down city in the entire world. I've spent 280 days in my house in the last two years. So like it's the politically, it was just so uh, tense here and I lost a lot of members from our church, but it was really about politics. It wasn't about Jesus. It wasn't about the crisis we were living through. It was about yeah. where we sat on vaccinations or where we sat on the lockdowns. And so it really brought, I suppose, COVID, and I'm sure it's similar in America, really brought some of these issues to the surface that maybe it was underlying, but the crisis brought brought the truth out. So as, as we finish, Kristen, um, I'd, I'd love to just maybe my final question, where did, more looking at leadership. So for a leader, let's not say a male leader or a female leader, let's just say for any leader, <laughs> talked a lot about gender roles today, which has been great. But just for a leader in these times um, with this fracturing and all the different things we've talked about today, like where do you think there's value putting effort, putting leadership, um, you know, investing as a leader, uh, navigating the division, the pol politicisation of everything as a leader, like what, 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 what would be your tips or advice in that space? Um, good luck, honestly. It's an incredibly difficult time to be a leader in religious spaces right now. As you well know, in, in America, it's, it's harrowing. I talk mm. with so many pastors, um, partly because I think of a, a failure of, in leadership for a very long time. And, um, Oh, I want to talk about a couple things very briefly. I mean, one is uh, one of the key themes that I, uh, I I came upon as I was researching this book is the problems that are caused when people show undue deference to leaders. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, the, the strong leadership that can be misused is a huge problem. And when I looked at evangelical culture, when I looked at churches, when I looked at Driscoll's Mars Hill, when I looked just at the way that the whole hierarchies work in evangelical spaces and hierarchy is so important. When I look at these conference circuits and I look at like the gospel coalition and who ends up on the main stage and who blurbs each other's books and all of those, again, the hierarchies of power and the rules are you, if you are kind of a newbie, you show deference to those who are above you in those hierarchies of power and you don't challenge them and you don't question them or you're seen as a traitor and you certainly aren't going to get invited onto the main stage next year, right? So these alliances that are built in ways that are deeply unhealthy uh, for the church and that can foster cultures of abuse. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my main takeaway is be very careful if mm -hmm. you are in a leadership position uh about your own motives and how you respond to people with less power than you and particularly to those with more power mm. that would be my biggest takeaway and then right. alongside that is courage like the courage to make those choices because mm -hmm. if you refuse to show deference to those leaders who have more power they are not going to extend the hand to you and mm. and you, it will come at a cost mm. and so you need courage to make those really hard choices and courage to, to speak truth, even if it will be unpopular. One person does that, you're probably gonna be out of a job. You're never mm -hmm. gonna go to a bigger church if that's your goal. If mm -hmm. all of us start doing that, that's when things can start to change. Mm -hmm. Really sounds like you're encouraging us to be like Christ and follow his example, so it's good. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> No, but it's great and I appreciate you being so honest because it is a time where courage is needed and it is a difficult, a difficult season. Um, again, a lot of statistics we get over here have come out of America and I hear that, you know, it's been un, um, just a phenomenal time of pastors stepping down from positions and even considering stepping down. And uh, yeah, it's really, really sad because we need good Christian leaders. Um, but you've got to trust God, don't you? I think, from in my opinion, I think there's a real uh, reformation of sorts in Christian leadership. Uh, things get pruned, don't they? And out of that pruning can come great fruitfulness. And I do look forward to the next decade because I know God is for us. And uh, and I think there'll be a new kind of leader uh, rising that's going to be a more true biblical leader, uh, and Christ-like leader. But it's it's not going to fit the halls of power and the hierarchies and the uh, pop culture Christianity. It's just not Christ never fits into that. So it's okay. truly radical. So, Christy, I really appreciate your time today. Um, we, we hear you becoming very popular with this book and everything. So I appreciate you taking time with us. And uh, thank you for your hard work because I know it's a lifetime of study and work and 
uh, prayer and your own discipleship and all these things that go into it. And I'm sure you're dealing with many difficult uh, challenges as well um, when these things, books and whatever become more public, uh, put you in the, under the microscope. So thank you for your contribution um, to the church and to the work of God. It's been great having thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate this. It was a delight. I trust you were impacted by that Leadership Lessons podcast. I would love to hear your thoughts about today's podcast. Please comment down below and please review the podcast and share it with a friend. Doing this inspires us and helps others to find the podcast. See you next time.